Oh, meter is so very nice. I think I'll do this workshop twice, but you don't have to because it's comprehensive and so useful and it's what have I done with the meter? No! Hey guys, my name is Dr. Katie Yales and I'm part of the team here at I Am Loud Productions. Welcome to Form Fundamentals. This is our mini-series leading you through the basics of poetic form. This episode covers meter how to recognize it, and how to write in it. Meter is often considered the trickiest aspect of poetic form to understand, and it does have a lot of components, but don't worry. In this episode, I'm going to walk you through step by step with a ton of examples. This is a long video, I know, but I promise it's worth it. By the end, you will understand meter inside and out, Plus, I will introduce you to a delightful falafel munching panda named Timothy. This Form Fundamentals mini-series is kicking off season two of our Return to Form project, which celebrates poetic form and shows how contemporary writers can use it in new and interesting ways. Massive thanks to National Lottery Funding through Creative Scotland for making this project possible. You can watch all of the videos in the Return to Form project through the playlist linked up there in the eye. Today, I'll begin this episode by defining meter and explaining how and why it's a core component of much poetry. We'll then go through the building blocks of meter bit by bit. First, we'll learn how to identify stresses and stress patterns. I'll then teach you the terms for some of the different kinds of poetic feet, specifically here the I am, the trochee, the dactyl, the anthebrach, and the anapest. After that, we'll start combining feet together to create lines, and I'll review the different terms for line length in poetic meter, from monometer to octameter. Next, I'll show you several examples of poetry in various meters, so that you can see for yourself how it works. Then I'll chat briefly about some strategic ways of bending and even breaking poetic meter. To wrap up, I'll give you some helpful tips for writing in meter, including how to create your own meter map so that you can use all of this information in composing your own poetry. I know that that is a lot, but I promise that at some point in this video, to reward you for everything that you are learning, you will get kittens. So let's go for it! First of all, what is meter? Meter is the term that we use in poetry to talk about rhythm, and there are various types of poetic meter to describe various ways of organizing rhythm in poetry. Meter is universal to language. Every sound, every aspect of speech has certain beats, certain patterns, certain rhythms that in poetry we call meter. The terms that we're going to go over in this workshop are simply ways of keeping track of these emphases, these beats, these rhythms in poetry. Meter is universal to language, to all speech, and being able to understand it helps us to be able to creatively wield it through poetry. Some forms of poetry require you to use a certain meter, a certain rhythm. For example, the Shakespearean sonnet is written in what we call iambic pentameter, and I'll go through that in this workshop. Just like rhyme, meter is something that our ears pick up on from a very early age. In the previous episode of Form Fundamentals on rhyme, I talked about nursery rhymes and how from a young age we can instinctively understand them, we grasp rhyme, and the exact same thing is true for meter. Jack and Jill went up the hill. There's a beat to that. Now, I will acknowledge that writing in a set meter like iambic pentameter has somewhat gone out of fashion in contemporary poetry. Many poets simply choose to write in free verse without set meter. That is totally fine. It is a personal choice. However, that does not mean that meter is dead and not used anymore in art. First of all, rappers rely on an intense understanding of meter to construct and perform their work. In fact, all musicians organize their work through meter. They call it rhythm, and they have different terminology for it, but it's the exact same principle at play. But even if you're not a rapper, you're not a musician, you're a poet who maybe isn't so interested in writing in a set meter like iambic pentameter, it's still really valuable to have a core understanding of meter and how it works. As I said in the first episode of Form Fundamentals, having a good understanding of the technical aspects of poetry, and specifically here the meter, the rhythm, how various points of emphasis will affect a line of poetry, all of that filters through to impact your poetry, whether you're writing in a set meter or just in freeform. 
This stuff is really helpful to learn, so bear with it. A brief disclaimer before we dive in, in this workshop I'm going to be teaching you about meter in English language poetry, which is based on stress patterns. Other languages and literary cultures have their own ways of organizing sound and emphasis in poetry, and what I'm saying here may not apply to all of them. For instance, there are poetic forms like the haiku in Japanese literary cultures which are organized by sound units similar to syllables rather than stresses. I'll go over all of that in my upcoming workshop on the renga. All right, enough defining and disclaiming. It is time to get into the meat of the workshop and start learning how to recognize meter. When we speak aloud, we naturally place emphasis on certain syllables. Let me demonstrate by introducing you to my good friend Timothy. Timothy the panda engineer enjoys falafel. I'm going to say that a bit differently. Timothy the panda engineer enjoys falafel. Mm, sounded weird, right? That's because that time I moved where I placed the emphasis. I'll show you what that looks like written out. Here, I've capitalized the syllables that we always emphasize when saying this sentence. Timothy, the panda engineer, enjoys falafel. Sounds much more natural now. And this illustrates how words have natural places of emphasis. We always say panda rather than panda, and engineer rather than engineer. So how can you tell where the emphasis falls in a word? I get that this might be maddening advice, but you'll know it when you hear it. Just as our mouths automatically understand how to say the word enjoy, our ears automatically hear that the word enjoy is wrong. This is intuitive, it just takes a little bit of practice to become conscious of it. The best way of figuring out where the emphasis naturally falls in a word is to say that word out loud in a really exaggerated way. Try saying the word out loud multiple times, each time emphasizing a different syllable, and yell out the syllable that you're emphasizing. Then see what sounds the most natural. For example, <clears throat> Timothy, Timothy, Timothy. If you're still stuck, try using it in a sentence. My cousin Timothy is two. My cousin Timothy is two. My cousin Timothy is two. Hopefully at this point you can tell that the first option is the correct one. In the name Timothy, the emphasis falls naturally on the first syllable. You may feel very, very silly doing this, but it is very helpful and you are learning, so stick with it. Okay, so how does all of this tie into poetry? In poetry, we call the places where we put emphasis on syllables the stresses. You have stressed syllables and unstressed syllables. The way the emphases fall in a line of poetry is called the stress pattern. There are many ways of marking, of notating the stress pattern in poetry. We're just going to stick with one way in this video to keep it simple, and I'll show you with the help of my good old friend Tim. Here, we're using open circles to mark the unstressed syllables, and closed circles to mark the stressed syllables. If this were a line of poetry that you were marking up to identify the stress pattern, and a pretty line of poetry it is, this is how you would do it. To make it easier to identify and to use these stress patterns, in poetry we have different terms for different patterns. I'll go through them now. First, an I am consists of one unstressed syllable followed by one stressed syllable. The word create is an example of an I am. The opposite pattern is called a trochee, which consists of one stressed syllable followed by one unstressed syllable. For example, the word tiger is a trochee. Next, we have three terms for three syllable long stress patterns. The dactyl goes stressed, unstressed, unstressed, as in the word multiply. The amphibrach is an unstressed syllable, a stressed syllable, then another unstressed syllable, like the word together. Finally, an anapest consists of two unstressed syllables ending in a stressed syllable, like the word interrupt. 
There are other terms too for other stress patterns, but these are the most common. In this video, I won't be going over stress patterns with the same emphasis on each syllable, like spondaic and pyrrhic meter, but I've linked below to some resources on them if you're interested. In poetry, there's a special word for these stress patterns. They're called feet. So an I am is an example of a poetic foot. I would encourage you guys to screenshot the video at this point or take some notes. I know that this is a lot of terms and we'll be using them throughout the rest of the video, but you can always refer back to this guide. All right, guys, now that we know these terms for different stress patterns in poetry, let's test our newfound knowledge with our pal Timmy. Okay, so we've established that the name Timothy consists of three syllables, the first of which is stressed. Checking our chart, we can see that a three-syllable stress pattern that goes stressed, unstressed, unstressed is called a dactyl. So Timothy is a dactyl. Skipping ahead for a moment, we have the word panda. That goes stressed, unstressed, panda, so that is called a trochee. Next, the word engineer. We would say that engineer, not engineer or engineer, so it goes unstressed, unstressed, stressed. That is called an anapest. Next, on to enjoys. We would say enjoys, not enjoys. So it goes unstressed, stressed, which means that it is an I am. Finally, falafel. We would say falafel, putting the stress on the middle syllable rather than falafel or falafel, so it goes unstressed, stressed, unstressed, which means that it is an amphibrach. Ta-da! The eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed, though, that there is one word in that example sentence that I did not give a term to. The word the. There aren't any poetry terms for the stress patterns of single-syllable words, and that's simply because there aren't really any inherent stresses in single-syllable words. It's not da da or da da, it's just da. The extent to which you emphasize or stress a single syllable word depends on the context, where that word falls in a sentence or a line of poetry, and the stress patterns of the words around it. In our example sentence, we wouldn't naturally stress the word the. We would say Timothy the panda rather than Timothy the panda. And that's true more broadly. Generally speaking, those little connecting words in a sentence, to, and, the, the words that in grammar we call particles, usually in a line of poetry, they are not stressed. I'll expand a little bit more on that later. Alrighty, let's layer in a new element. Now that you understand how to identify different stress patterns in words, and you know the terms for different stress patterns, different feet, we're gonna start adding the feet together to create a line. For the next wee while, I'm just gonna give you examples using I am's, but everything that I'm gonna say applies to the other kinds of feet as well, dactyls, trochees, etc. Let's introduce a new example sentence with more hungry animals. Take the sentence, today bizarre giraffes consume baguettes. I want you to take a moment, pause the video on this sentence, and read that aloud, trying to work out the stress pattern. Pause here. Okay, welcome back. So hopefully as you read this line out aloud, you noticed that it went, Today, bizarre giraffes consume baguettes. Each word in this sentence consists of two syllables, the first unstressed and the second stressed. That means that every word in this sentence is an I am. The meter in this line goes T-tum, 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 T-tum. Okay, intrepid scholars, if we came across this gorgeous line of poetry and we were trying to figure out what kind of meter it is, how would we do that? First, we know that this meter is iambic because it consists of repeating iams. In order to understand the line length and get the technical term for that, we need to count to see how many iams are in the line. So let's count them up. Today, one, bizarre, two, giraffes, three, consume, four, baguettes, five. There are five iams in this line. So 
what's the word for a line of poetry consisting of five iams? Here, knowing Latin comes in handy. I mean, I don't know Latin, but I sure can Google. The prefix penta means five. The meter of this poem is iambic pentameter, which means that there are five iams per line. Pentameter ain't all that's out there, though. There are different terms in poetry for different line lengths. I'll show you. I'm going to lay out a key to the different terms for line length in poetic meter. Each one of these terms refers to how many feet are in the line. First, monometer has just one foot. Continuing with our example of iams, if you had a line of poetry that consisted of the word today, so one iam, we would call that iambic monometer. Dimeter has two feet per line. The line today away consists of two iams, so it's iambic dimeter. Obviously, these are very short lines. Monometer and dimeter aren't used very often in poetry. Then, trimeter has three feet per line, tetrameter has four feet per line, and as we saw, pentameter has five feet per line. Getting into longer line lengths, hexameter is six feet per line, heptameter is seven feet per line, and octameter is eight feet per line. Like before, guys, I'd encourage you to screenshot the video at this point or take some notes so that you have this information handy for the rest of the workshop. Okay, to recap here, when you're describing the meter of a line of poetry, there are two core words. The first word describes the kind of feet in the line. So if the line consists of iams, the meter is iambic. If it consists of anapests, we would call that meter anapestic. The second word describes the number of feet in a line, so dimeter for two feet per line or heptameter for seven feet per line. You can combine these terms in any way that you want to create any kind of metrical line that you want. So you could have amphibrachic monometer or dactylic hexameter. It's totally up to you. Okay, now that we've got all of that down, I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball into it. Hang with me here. So far, we've been talking about these stress patterns, these feet, iams, trochees, dactyls, etc., as single words. Based on this, you might be thinking that iambic meter can only consist of words that are iams, or trochaic meter can only consist of words that are trochees. I've started my explanation of poetic meter in this way because I think that it's the simplest way into it, but, and this is important, Lines of iambic meter do not just consist of iambic words. Iambic meter just means that you have to use a pattern of stresses in the line that follows an iambic beat, which here is t-tum, 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 etc. An iam is just a set of syllables, a set of syllables that goes unstressed, then stressed. And a single I am, a single foot, a single set of syllables, does not have to consist of a single word. It can contain multiple words or parts of words. Quickly returning to our example, today bizarre giraffes consume baguettes. That is an example of a line of poetry that is iambic that only consists of iambic words. But you might have noticed it sounded a bit stilted. It was actually pretty hard to write because it's just iambic words in the line. I couldn't use any little words like the giraffes. To illustrate how poetic feet don't just have to consist of individual words, let me show you an example of an actual poem. Let's take the first two lines of our example poem in Form Fundamentals, which is Calamo Dwyer's The Kiss. This is a Shakespearean sonnet, so I'll give it away at the top. It is written in iambic pentameter. I'm going to read these first two lines aloud. First off, we promised this, a final kiss. We are a rolling wave approaching land. Now you can see that I've marked out the stress pattern. I'm going to read these lines again, really emphasizing their natural stresses. First off, we promised this a final kiss. We are a rolling wave approaching land. So here, you can actually see that there aren't any iambic words in these first two lines. It consists of single-syllable words, 
trochees, and an amphibrach. However, the beat is still iambic because the lines follow the rhythm ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum, ti tum. Let's work through it. The first iam consists of two single syllable words. First off, as we spoke about earlier, single syllable words don't have inherent stresses. So this phrase could either be an I am or a trochee, depending on how you read it. First off or first off. Here, in the context of this poem, it's the former. The next I am consists of a single word and part of a word. We prom. Multisyllable words are really, really helpful in poetry in identifying meter because they have a set stress pattern. The word promised is a trochee because the stress falls on the first syllable. However, here, a trochee fits into the iambic structure because the stressed syllable is in the second half of the iam. The word is divided across the iam so that it fits the meter. In the third foot of the first line of poetry, we finish the word, ist this. Here, the emphasis falls on this, which is great. It's the last word in the phrase. First off, we promised this. So it's important. Promised what? The fourth foot, the fourth I am, works just like the second I am. It's a single unstressed word, a, uh, and then the first part of a trochee, fine, from final. Then in the fifth and last I am, we wrap up the word final and end again on a stressed syllable, ulkis. That is how iambic pentameter works. It's the pattern of unstressed stressed repeated five times in a line. Now, when we extend out to show you the entirety of Callum's sonnet, you can see that the whole poem is in iambic pentameter. Every single line consists of 10 syllables and goes in this alternating rhythm of unstressed stressed. Iambic pentameter is one of the most common meters in poetry. It's what Shakespeare used to write the majority of his work, including not only poetry, but his plays as well. I like to think that it's so central because it's like a heartbeat. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. But of course, iambic pentameter is not all that's out there. I'm gonna give you guys two more example poems with different meters so that we can have some practice identifying meter. And I think you'll probably be familiar with both of the examples. Let's start off a little spooky here. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron, bubble. So how do we identify the meter here? First, go for the multi-syllable words, as I was saying before. That's a real key. Double. The stress there is on the first syllable. We say double, not double. So that's a trochee. Then we have it again. So another trochee. Next is toil end. That's two single syllable words, so it could go either way, but as we've been saying, usually the little connecting words are unstressed. So this set, toil end, is also a trochee. Finally, trouble, just like double, places the stress on the first syllable. So that's a trochee. Moving on to the next line, it works just the same. Fire, is a trochee, and so are cauldron and bubble. Plus the burn end works just like toil end from the line above as a trochee. All right, so we know that these lines of poetry consist of trochees, so we call the meter trochaic. The next step is to count how many trochees there are. Double, one, double, two, toil end, three, trouble, four. There are four trochees, four feet in this line. What do we call a four-foot line? If you refer back to the guide from earlier, you can see that that's called tetrameter. So this poetry is in trochaic tetrameter. Boom! As I said earlier, the grand majority of Shakespeare's work is written in iambic pentameter, and this witch's spell from Macbeth in trochaic tetrameter is a notable exception. Do you think that maybe he switched up the meter here so that the way that the creepy, weird witches spoke was subtly but noticeably different from the way that the normal characters spoke? 
That's what scholars suggest is going on here, and I think it's a great example of the way that meter can subtly but importantly affect meaning in poetry and plays. Okay, one more example here to help you test out your newfound knowledge of how to identify the lines of poetic meter. We'll move from Halloween-y vibes to another kind of festive spirit. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. I challenge you to pause the video here, read the poem aloud to yourself, try and identify the meter, see how you do, and then restart the video and we'll go through it together. Pause here. Okay, welcome back. So when I read this poem aloud, the first thing that strikes me is that it sounds a little bit like a waltz. It's in threes. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house. If I tried to read it out loud in sets of two, like iams or trochees, it would sound really weird. For instance, here's me trying to read it out to an iambic rhythm. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house. Just from listening, we know, okay, this poem is not in sets of two. This poem must use a meter where the foot consists of three beats. The next thing we need to figure out is, okay, are the feet in this meter dactyls, anapests, or amphibracts? And the way that we figure this out is by finding out where the stress falls in each foot. Again, the best way to figure it out is to try reading it each way with each possible stress of syllables. So let's start with dactyls. Dactyls go stressed, unstressed, unstressed. So reading this with a dactylic rhythm would sound like, "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house." Hmm, let's try the next one. Amphibrax go unstressed, stressed, unstressed. So reading this poem with an amphibrachic meter would sound like, "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house." Mm, let's try the last option. Finally, anapests go unstressed, unstressed, stressed. That would sound like, "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house." Aha! That is the one that sounds the best. So we know now that this meter consists of anapests, which means that we call it anapestic. Finally, we need to count the number of anapests in the line to get the line length. Before, we were counting sets of twos for iams and trochees, but now we're counting sets of threes. Let's count it out. Twas the night, one, before Chris, two, miss when all, three, through the house, four. There are four anapests, four feet in this line. So if you check your guide, you will see that we have anapestic tetrameter. <sighs> That was a lot of terms, a lot of concepts, and a lot of stress is. I think that you have earned some kittens. All right, guys. Up until this point in the video, we have focused on perfect meter. I've showed you examples of poems that rigidly adhere to their stress patterns. I'm not going to spend too long on this, but I do want to briefly discuss ways that poets can bend and even break meter for stylistic effect. First of all, you can choose to vary your meter in a single poem, with some lines using one meter and other lines using another kind of meter. Some set poetic forms actually require you to do this. For example, the noble limerick. Take this really exquisite example. Oh, there once was a lady named Kate, and she thought that her workshops were great. But she made such bad jokes that she angered some folks who had pitchforks. Alas, a sad fate. Generally, in a limerick, lines 1, 2, and 5 are in anapestic trimeter, and lines 3 and 4 are in anapestic dimeter. The final form that we're featuring in this season of Return to Form also varies up its meter line by line. In each sestet of standard habi, lines 1, 2, 3, and 5 are in iambic tetrameter, whereas lines 4 and 6 are in iambic dimeter. 
You'll note that in each of those examples, the poetic form switches up the length of the line, so going from tetrameter to dimeter, but it keeps the kind of foot in the line the same, so sticking iambic all the way through, for example. It is possible to switch up the kind of foot that you're using within a single poem to go from iambic to trochaic, but this can get pretty tricky pretty early, so I would encourage you to hold off on that until you really feel confident in your grasp of meter. Katie, I hear you say, I am confident, I know what I'm doing, here's a question, can you switch from iambic to trochaic in a single line of poetry? Well, very assertive person, yes and no. The short answer is no. Once you have the kind of foot that you're using in a line, you gotta stick with that all the way through the line. That being said, you can slice off or add syllables at the starts and ends of lines to create partial feet. This is really complicated, so I'm just gonna skim the surface here. If you're interested in learning more, I've linked to a few resources below. But very briefly, let me show you one way that that can work using my limerick as an example. Limericks are famously flexible forms. Although they have to be written in triplets, specifically either anapests or amphibracts, there's a little bit of leeway about deleting or adding extra syllables to the beginning and ends of lines. Let me show you through an amended example of this limerick. Oh, there once was a lady named Katie, and she thought that her workshops were weighty, but she made such bad jokes that she angered some folks who had pitchforks. They were not her mateys. What I've done here, apart from penning a crime against poetry, is I've added an extra unstressed syllable to the ends of lines 1, 2, and 5. You can see that the core structure of these lines is still in triplets, but the ending just has an extra syllable. The technical name for this is a weak ending. Basically, if a line ends on a stressed syllable, it's a strong ending. If it ends on an unstressed syllable, it's a weak ending. In the past, this was referred to as a feminine ending because it's weak. But ingrained literary sexism can get in the bin. I am not going to teach you to use that term. In any case, here I have added an extra syllable to create weak endings at the ends of these lines. Theoretically, I could also delete some syllables, so I could start the poem, There once was a lady named Katie. You'll see, though, that the core structure of this poem still uses triplets. It still uses anapests. So even though we're chopping and changing the starts and ends of lines, the core remains unchanged. All right, one more note on bending meter. What if the metrical bend isn't consistent? What if the meter just is wrong in a certain place? This is a generalization, but broadly speaking, when a poem sticks to meter, that indicates reliability, consistency. Da dun, da dun, da dun, da dun, da dun. We know what's coming next, and that's soothing to a certain extent. So if a poem suddenly breaks meter, that can be used to indicate conflict, discord, something being wrong. Even if you don't consciously recognize the change in meter, your ear will pick up on it and go, mm, something's a little funny here. And as a writer, you can use strategically breaking meter to your advantage. Say that you're writing a poem in iambic pentameter about a lovely day out in the woods. And then suddenly, a tiger appears! You could break the meter, do something incorrect in the metrical pattern just at the moment where the tiger appears to really reinforce the wrongness of the moment, the fact that the tiger is out of place in that context. In that way, form reinforces function. All right, guys, final bit of the video. So in this episode, I have chucked a lot of terms, a lot of concepts at you. And now it's time for the most important part. How do you as a writer actually use all of this? How do you write in poetic meter? I'll be honest, it takes a lot of practice, both with listening to it, with reading it, and writing in it, but it's well worth it and you will get the hang of it. First of all, if you know that you want to write a poem in a certain meter, say iambic pentameter, it's really helpful to read a lot of poetry written in that meter, and specifically to read it aloud. 
It's really funny. A certain meter, a certain rhythm will get stuck in your head just like a catchy tune will. It's the same principle. Then, once that meter is really stuck in your head, once you really understand it physically, practice writing in it. And I don't just mean practice writing poetry in it. In the first episode of Form Fundamentals, I demonstrated the technique of free writing, which is basically stream of consciousness drafting without a clear plan, just getting words down on the page. This may seem nutty, but it's really, really helpful to free write in meter. It doesn't matter what you're writing, it doesn't matter if it makes any sense, just put words down on the page in a certain rhythm to help you get used to that rhythm. You can also try doing that same thing aloud without writing it down, just sort of free speaking in meter to help you get it in your head. So let me try this in an iambic beat. Today I went into the shops to buy a giant cherry pie. It was so good. Yum, 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 yum. Okay, so we trailed off a little bit at the end there, but I was saying words in a meter. I was getting it in my head. This really helps because then when you do sit down to write your poem in meter, you'll have that rhythm in your head, you'll be accustomed to using it with words, so your poem is more likely to flow more naturally. And when you do sit down to write that poem, there is a really helpful tool that I always use when writing poetry in meter that I'm going to share with you now that I call a meter map. Meter maps are basically keys, they're guides to the poetic meter of a certain poetic structure. They're so helpful for testing out whether your ideas, your words, your drafts fit into the meter that you've chosen, and they're great for doing a lot of trial and error. So if you're anything like me, if you're using a meter map when you're writing a poem in meter, you might go through 17 of them, but luckily they are very, very easy to set up. Here I'm showing you how to make a meter map for iambic pentameter. Because there are 10 syllables in iambic pentameter, your meter map should be 10 columns wide. Each column is for a single syllable. The next thing you have to do is to somehow mark which syllables, which columns, should be stressed and which should be unstressed. Here I've done that in two different ways, both by writing a U at the top of the column for unstressed syllables and an S at the top of the column for stressed syllables, and by coloring in the stressed columns in red. Remember, iambic pentameter starts with unstressed, then stressed, and alternates. So every odd syllable, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, is unstressed, and every even syllable, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, is stressed. You can create your own meter maps for every single kind of meter. Just adjust the number of columns and the color coding so that you know where the stresses should naturally fall in that meter. And I've shown you here on a sheet of paper, but of course you can also do this on a computer by setting up a spreadsheet. Alrighty, time for my final tip, and it's on performing poetry in meter. Just because the metrical scheme is there, doesn't mean that you need to emphasize it in the way that you read a poem aloud, and in fact, it's usually better if you don't emphasize it. For example, if I were to perform the first two lines of Callum's poem exaggerating the stresses, it would sound like this. First off, we promised this, a final kiss, we are a rolling wave, approaching land. That way it sounds rigid, jarring but I also have the choice of reading it like any other sentence. For instance, like this. First off, we promised this, a final kiss. We are a rolling wave approaching land. Reading it in that way doesn't mean that the meter isn't there. It just means that I'm not calling attention to it in my performance. Think of the metrical structure of a poem like a skeleton. It's there, it's supporting the poem, but we don't need to see it to feel its effects. We can soften it with flesh. Weird metaphor, but hopefully you catch my drift. Meter is intrinsic to speech, to language, the skeleton is always there. How you construct it, how you use it, how you perform it, all of that is up to you. Guys, 
We made it. That is it for this episode of Form Fundamentals. I really, really hope that this episode was helpful for you in understanding poetic meter. I tried to be as thorough as possible, but of course there are lots of nuances, lots of exceptions, other terms that we didn't have time to cover here. So if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the comments below and I will get back to you with an answer. And guys, this was our final episode of Form Fundamentals. Ah! However, there is so much more to come for this season of Return to Form. We are just about to start releasing the brand new poems and the workshops on specific poetic forms for this season. First up, we have Harry Baker's Contrapuntal Poem and my workshop on how to write contrapuntal poetry. It's a lot of fun, so stay tuned for that. Guys, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you doing? Subscribe to the channel. Like the video while you're there and do ring that bell icon so that you get notified every time that we post a new video. You can also directly support our work and receive a ton of fabulous perks by signing up to our Patreon for as little as one pound per month. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for learning meter with me and happy writing.